Kira, folks, today we are going to talk about functions. Specifically, we're going to talk about mathematical functions. And a mathematical function, uh, well, they're pretty much everywhere. It's basically something that just relates one set to another. So let's have a look at a picture. So here we can see we've got sort of two bubbles. I've got a blue bubble here and it's got some x values and I've got a green bubble and it's got some letters. Now the function is actually neither of these bubbles together. The function is how I get from the blue to the green and that's in the middle here f at x. So this f is the keyword which is reserved and specifically means function. Now that might not be too surprising. Pretty much everywhere we see f in terms of calculus is going to be reserved for function. And so we won't actually be naming any variables f. That will be one of our reserved letters. So the function are these black arrows. And one thing we know about an arrow, as in this case, is that these arrows are one way. So I'll just make them a little bit bigger. So these arrows don't go sort of a, in a backwards direction. These arrows only go in a forward direction. Now, if I go back up to my definition here, we have a rule that relates members of a group. So the arrows here relate the members of the blue bubble to the green bubble. And that's pretty much it. This function f at x, it could mean anything. We could be taking this input value x3 and doing something to turn it into c. So another way to view this is using the words input and output. So here we have all of my inputs and this could keep on going until the nth input. And then after we go through a function, we have some outputs, A, B, C, and we could have all the way up to N as an output. So when we see a function, when we see F bracket X sub three, close bracket, we're saying this is F at X three, and then the output here is gonna be C. So we have the function at the input x3, we apply this arrow to it, and that equals c. So here we have a formal definition of a function where f is a rule and f here can be thought of as my arrow. And what does it do? Well, it assigns an element of x in the blue bubble to exactly one in the green bubble. So let's just go back. An element in the blue bubble, these are the inputs, to exactly one in the green bubble. Now, that's very important. That means that I cannot have the case where x3 here Let's draw this in red, where x3 here also goes to E and also goes to G, okay, because I can only do exactly one of these outputs. So this is not allowed. And the way I think of this is that we have multiple outputs. We will see this a little bit better when we look at a graph in a minute. Okay, so A and B are usually real numbers and we won't be worrying about anything other than the real numbers. That just means basically all numbers and you can think of decimals included and fractions are included, okay, and all positive negative numbers up until infinity. So some names here, 
A is called the domain. So A, this is my blue bubble, and these are my inputs. And B is called the range, and these are the green bubble, and these are my outputs. So if I just write these down, we go from the inputs in the domain, and then we go to the outputs in the range. And the way that we get there is by some function and a general term to describe that function will just be f at x. And that's what you say, f at x. And you write f bracket x close bracket as my general function. OK, how do we look at a function? Well, a function here is shown in three different formats. So we have an equation, where this says that f at x equals 3x minus 7. So you take some input value x, and then the output you're going to multiply by 3 and subtract 7. And so that will be some transformation to your input. And that's one way uh, to represent a function. And that's the most common way here is by an equation, and that can tell you a whole lot of information. Um, some different ways to represent this information is either with a table or with a graph. So first of all, with a table, we can see here the x values. These are my inputs. And we can see here the f at x values. These are the outputs. So we start with minus 3, and I can just write it over here. I'm going to write f at minus 3 equals, and then I'm going to go to my equation that tells me what to do, and I'm going to sub in minus 3. So everywhere I see an x, I have to sub in minus 3. Make sure you include your brackets. Subtract 7. And now this is a mini equation that I could solve. So 3 times minus 3 is minus 9. Subtract 7, and that comes out to be minus 16, which we see right here. So that's just applying one of the inputs and getting one of the outputs. And if you mix this up and apply a number of different inputs, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and we'll get a number of different outputs. And we don't necessarily know how those outputs are going to change or how they're going to look. And that brings us to our third way of representing a function, and that is by a graph. And this one is, I think, the most handy and the most useful. I'll give that one a star. I'm going to be using this one a lot as we go through our work. So here we have the same function, right? This is my equation. And what we've done is we've taken our table of values, which is this. Maybe I should draw this arrow this way. We've taken our table of values and we've just plotted the points. So one of my points here is minus 1, 10. So that looks like this, minus 1, comma, minus 10, sorry. And so on my graph, minus 1 is on the x, and minus 10 is way down here off the screen. So let's try to plot a different point. So let's plot 1, comma, 4. If I were to draw this as a point, I write 1, comma, minus 4, close brackets. And now starting from the middle, I go over 1, I go down 4, and I get to that first point. And we can continue the trend if we increase x by 1. The next point is 2, comma, minus 1. And now I can plot that. I go over to 2, and I go down to minus 1. And there is my point. And so all of these points will form a line which is the red one that has been plotted. 
Now the line, just draw over this, the line is actually the entire function. The table of values representing the points, these are just points that are part of the function because there are numbers in between two and three, right? There's 2.1, 2.2, two and a half, two and three quarters. And all of those numbers also have an output function. So the line is a better re representation on the graph than just the table of values. But the table of values can help you find the graph and vice versa. The graph can help you validate table of values if you have one. The notation and evaluation of a function. I've already talked about notation. So this one is we write f at x and then you have some value here. So that could be a something like that. When we say evaluating a function, what we are doing is we're taking a particular value of x and we're finding what the output is. Remember, x are my inputs. And if you have an equation, you sub in the value everywhere you see. So on both sides here, everywhere you see the x. And then the evaluating part gets me to my outputs. I think I've been doing these in green. So here you solve the right hand side and then whatever value you get is the output. So for example here f at 2 f at 2, well we sub in 2 for x, 3 times 2 is 6 minus 7 is minus 1. So when we evaluate the function at 2, we get minus 1. When we evaluate the function at 3, we get 2. Evaluate the function at 3 to get two or to output two, something like that. The next thing I want to talk about in terms of a function is how can we tell if what we have actually is a function or not? So one great informal way to do this is using the vertical line test. So here's my line. And my function then, in this case, is going to be the circle. And in this case, it's going to be this oscillating, or maybe that's a cubic type. F at x. So back to my formal definition of a function, I'm only allowed to have exactly one output for every input. So let's go through this. So for every input, inputs are along my x axis. So for every input, so moving along, I have an input here, call that x1. And I have another input here, call that x2. But I'm actually not too worried about that second input. So let's just concentrate on x1. So that's my input. Now my output is the y value. So I'm going to draw a vertical line here representing my y's. And the output in this case, well, I've got one right there. So that point is x1 comma y1. I can draw that x1 comma y1 comma y1. Now looking along my function, I also have an output up here. So I have one input x1 and I have an output here. I also have a second output up here. 
And this is the important part. This is where we say, uh-oh, I already have y1. Now, up here, I have y2. So I have two x1s. Sorry, I have a single x1. I'm just going to redraw some of this. So x1, x1, y1. Now up here I have x1, comma, y2. Okay, and that's also a point. It's a real point on the circle. There it is. But the important part is that I have two outputs for one input. So here I can say the circle is not a function because it violates the vertical line test. Not a function. Now let's exit the slideshow. We're going to keep you. So one way to do this is to just think that I can move my line from left to right through my function. So I'll move my line through my cubic function and I only ever cross the line once. And that's in fact actually exactly what I want in order to have a function. If I move my line here through my circle, I can pass the line through the circle. Here I only cross once right on the tangent, but as I keep going through, every other point has two intersections, including the one that I already highlighted. So you can imagine passing your vertical line test. You can imagine passing your vertical line through the function and seeing how many times it actually intersects the graph. And that's how I would decide if or if not, I have a function using the vertical line test. Okay, next up is this word gradient. What is a gradient function? And we will be talking about gradient function a lot in the coming weeks and in the coming sessions. So the only thing I want you to take away from here is that all these terms are the same gradient, slope, letter M, and then rise over run. And they're used interchangeably. Gradient maybe sounds a bit fancier, but it's just the same as slope. It's just the same as the letter M in the equation of a line. And it's just the same as the way to calculate the slope, which is the rise over the run. So we do have a formula here. For m, and you may recognize m from the equation of a line y equals m x plus b. Sometimes you write it m x plus c, depending on where you first learned this, where m tells you the value of the slope. Right? So you point at this, sorry, not the x. So you point at this m and you say that is my slope. You point at the B and you say that is my intercept. And this is known as standard form for a straight line. So using any two points, we can calculate the gradient or the slope between them. So let's take a look. So here we have a couple of examples. To read a gradient, we start on the line and then go up or down first and then back to the line. Then back to the line. So what does this mean? Just like my vertical line test, 
when we read math and equations, we read from left to right. We read from left to right. So when you're calculating a slope in your two points on the line, you have to start with the leftmost point. So that one is right here. And then depending on which way you need to go, it's either up or down, you end up at the second point here. So in this case, first we go up four and then we go to the right six. So the rise is four divided by six. The slope is two thirds and two thirds will be a positive sloping line. And if you get mixed up about your positive and your negative sloping line, well this number here comes out to be positive. And positive lines go up and to the right. Go up and to the right. So the very next one to get us started, what we're doing here is first we're going down. So again, we come from left to right. So the leftmost point is here and we're trying to get to zero comma one. So first we go down and that means that we have a negative. And then we go to the right, which is positive. So maybe if I draw, so both of that one's positive. This one is negative, this one is negative, that one is not negative. And then we do the math, we say the rise is minus three divided by four, and of course this comes out to be negative. So that's negative 0 0.75. And so this line then is down and to the right. Up and to the right, down and to the right. So again, you find your leftmost point for this third example. So it's at one, one, following along, pick another point that crosses. So first we go up three and then we go to the right by one and so this slope is three. Again, that slope is positive. So you can do this with any two points as long as they're on the line and all of the slopes will be the same for a linear function. If you have a curved function, that will be different and that will be something that we will cover shortly.